Okay, great. So we are online for today's webinar um, over the topic uh, DeFi 2.0, Interchain Operability and Analytics. I have four wonderful guests here today. Uh, Peter from Anyblocks Analytics, Fabian from Sharp Explorer, Iona from the DI Association and Stefan from Block Demon. Um, we will touch on um, several different points um, regarding DeFi, institutionals, NFTs, um, I think there's a lot of uh, interesting trends right now going on, but I would suggest that we um, start with like a brief introduction and maybe also for better context, explain um, the company you're working for. Um, I would say uh, ladies first and would ask Iona to start. Thank you, Christian, and great to be on. Looking forward to the discussion. So I am Yana Sulpatanu, Chief Strategy Officer at DIA Association and also Principal for, for DIA Labs. Uh, DIA, which stands for Decentralized Information Asset, is an open source um, Oracle provider. Um, and the way we have differentiated ourselves in the market is via our community involvement angle and also transpar transparency and immutability. Um, just for the listeners who potentially don't know or might know, but just in case they, they don't, an Oracle is a sort of a bridge between off-chain and on-chain environments because smart contracts are confined to uh, only operating uh, on the network they reside on without automated uh, ingestion capabilities of off-chain data, uh, oracles are needed to, to enable that off-chain to on-chain off on -chain and vice versa um, transfer of data. And this is where we come in. There are a couple of oracle providers in the market, uh, but like I said, we have a very clear differentiator in terms of our transparency angle, but also community involvement across our product lifecycle. I'll pass Thank it on you, to Anna. Peter. Sure. Okay, who's next? Peter, maybe? Sure. Hi, my name is Peter Eulberg. I'm the CEO and co-founder of AnyBlock Analytics. We are a blockchain solution provider based in Mainz, Germany. We have two business units. One is providing data access, RPC access, index data, enriched data, and an alerting interface. And in the second unit, we provide machine-to-machine -machine services, infrastructure services. So we uh, run a chain link oracle. We are graph indexer, um, provide several uh, services for validation purposes and data providing in general. And besides that, uh, we also just merged uh, with Block Demon, which is also in the call. Uh, so I hand it over to Stefan. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, my name is Stefan Schmidt. I'm part of the sales and business development team of Block Demon in Europe. And Block Demon is an infrastructure pro or node infrastructure provider. And we do two things, um, access to blockchains um, for 40 different protocols uh, and more coming and staking services for 20 of those. And um, I guess both services have some touching points to DeFi. So I'm really uh, happy to join this webinar. Thank you, Stefan. And Fabian next. Yeah, hi, hi, I'm Fabian. Uh, great to be here. Good morning. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of uh, Sharp Explorer, what it is currently called. And I believe this is probably the, the freshest startup in this round because we are just uh, found it and um, we are actually rebranding very soon so maybe keep an eye out on the space um, there will be a new name uh, what uh, we want to achieve is um, um, we, are, we want to provide reporting and research data for semi-professional and professional investors uh, in the future targeting institutional investors we want to provide um, financial metrics and and uh, risk assessment for DeFi and uh, we want to provide this on an aggregated basis so that you can um, look at the complicated DeFi strategies in single line items and um, grasp um, grasp the, the, the metrics with one glance and um, then in the future also report on your on your transactions and wallet data and cross chain whatever you have invested in and your portfolio. Thank you, Fabian. Yeah, I, I am very much happy to have you four here on board today for the for the webinar for true experts, especially also very nice that uh, Peter and Stefan will become soon um, colleagues um, because both companies have just merged. So it's also somewhat coincidence that uh, both are both uh, here today representing their um, the enterprises. 
Uh, let's start. Uh, let's dive right into the topic. Um, the topic is uh, multi-chain interoperability, DeFi 2.0, analytics. Um, what what we have been observing recently um, was very much that um, a lot of new layer ones have basically become much more prominent um, in the names of Solana, uh, Avalanche. Um, what do you guys perceive like the current market situation? I think we have heard a lot of about institutionals entering the market. However, it seems like retail um, is still very much like the driving force behind the whole uh, DeFi space. Um, anybody who would like to comment on that? Um, I want to say it's a big question. Maybe we can split it into several parts. I, I guess part mm -hmm. of it is first, um, what of the blockchains might prevail. And mm -hmm. um, I can just say, I, I think it's really interesting. We have seen Ethereum historically having the biggest developer base. Um, I would say seeing the largest adoption and probably being the leading smart contract chain. And so also, let's say, launchpad for all these DeFi layer twos. Um, and I think this is still a very strong application. But of course, the gas fees currently are not really fun, um, mm -hmm. which I think is why other protocols have a realistic uh, chance to, you know, to, to slide in and maybe grab some of the market share. And as you mentioned, some, especially like Avalanche and Solana, see, see a lot of adoption currently, but um, others might as well. I think what speaks for the future of Ethereum is that all of them try to build in some Ethereum compatibility, uh, you know, bridges, um, being mm -hmm. compatible with it. Uh, I, I think that shows that and, and also what you hear in the communities is, is the word tribalism. They don't want to fight against each other. They want to work um, hand in hand. And I, I think um, while this is also a noble thought, some of it is also that you Ethereum won't be out of the picture. It still will play a big role. Personally, and this is just a personal opinion, I think that we will see a, a solution in which multiple chains will play a significant role. Um, Ethereum will be one of it. The others uh, are still to be decided. I think this is also, of course, the stance that we have as a company, as we are pretty agnostic when it comes to blockchains. We just want to help people build on it. And so as Blockdaemon, I would say we don't have the biggest stake in it. We are close to a lot of communities, but uh, yeah, this somewhat overlaps. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if yeah. I might jump in, I actually agree with that stance. I see a multi-chain future mm -hmm. where Ethereum will still play a predominant role, especially uh, short to midterm. Um, we at DIA have integrated with uh, a variety of uh, non EVM and non EVM compatible chains, and also L1s, various L1s and L2s. All of the chains you mentioned that are competitors to Ethereum, we've integrated with them Solana, Avalanche, et cetera. Um, I think, in order, because you referenced DeFi 2.0 or next gen DeFi, uh, let's take a step back and understand what DeFi 1.0 represents and then to potentially have a, a better overview of the ecosystem. So, at least for my mental filter or X ray, uh, DeFi 1.0, where all of these big protocols were built, right? Um, that happened as a result of the emulation of traditional financial services processes and products. They were recreated in a decentralized environment. Let's cut the intermediaries, replace them with code. But as that DeFi 1.0 ecosystem started to get more increasingly sophisticated, you now have uh, composability amongst all of these protocols whereby you create layers on top of it that are now called DeFi 2.0 potentially that have no analogy uh, in, in the traditional financial services world. So all of a sudden you speak about things like liquidity as infrastructure and a couple of other angles and elements uh, that you don't, well, where you don't have a direct uh, analog or a direct analogy with, with TradFi. So I think DeFi 2.0 is a very sophisticated ecosystem. We're just uh, grasping uh, its incipient face. Uh, combine that with the metaverse and play to earn and, and all of that uh, open economic systems enabled by the metaverse and actually see a symbiosis there between the metaverse and DeFi. And all of a sudden you understand that there's no way one chain can support all of that, right? So um, I do agree Ethereum is the most sustainable, uh, not sustainable ecologically, but sustainable and in terms of infrastructure, um, um, reliance on infrastructure, right? It's the best chain. If, if you look at, if 
even the, the latest or the, the most uh, relevant, the blue chip uh, entities in the metaverse, they're all built on Ethereum, decentralized, Somnium space, uh, the sandbox. Uh, so it's still very, very much predominant. But of course, the other L1s are, are catching up. They have a slightly different infrastructure and, and they're trying to um, find a different solution for the blockchain trilemma, decentralization, scalability, security. Uh, but like I said, the, the ecosystem and, and uh, the ecosystem DeFi 2.0 and the metaverse is so, so sophisticated that you will need to have a multi-chain uh, system architecture to, to enable it. But again, like I said, I think Ethereum will still play a dominant role um, for the sh short and medium term. Mm -hmm. I just want to add a little bit uh, and uh, say... And for the, uh, making some advertisement for a couple of layer one uh, chains, because I think there's lots of stuff going on and there will be uh, a continuous explosion in those things, especially EVM based chains, even though they might not be the most contemporary state of technology. But for example, uh, we see lots of adoption on XDAI uh, that uh, just announced the news that they might become Gnosis chain at some point. So there's even some uh, consolidation going on. Also, there's productive stuff going on on small chains or industry-specific chains like the Energy Web chain from the Energy Web Foundation. And uh, both of these chains are, bin uh, chains are binary compatible, EVM-based chains. So there's lots of fortitious um, uh, interchange uh, of technology going on, as well as bridges and other stuff, identity, for example. And the last one I want to mention also EVM compatible is a POA network. Uh, for example, there's a project called Ariane and uh, they are doing NFT in respect to Breitling watches on POA network. So um, on these, let's call them little chains or smaller chains or industry specific chains, there's also a lot of adaption, lots of innovation and so forth. So uh, before going to DeFi 2.0, I think there's lots of uh, layer one uh, basic use cases, uh, uh, um, innovation and growth. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I just like, uh, I, I want to support all this, what you said. Um, I think we will see, this is just the beginning, we will see a massive explosion in layer ones and all the ecosystems that we have now on Ethereum will just be copied one to one to other blockchains. And maybe in five years, we see a rapid consolidation towards, I don't know, maybe four or five specialized layer ones. And it will heavily be, who will survive will heavily depend on, I think, on what kind of frameworks the chains offer for developers, um, for, for easy development and for fast development. And on the other hand, um, the ad adoptability by the users, what is easy to adopt, where can you put, um, which ones are easy to put more layers onto it. And I think it's kind of like with every, every innovation curve, um, who's disrupting the disruption in the end. So with the, with the start of the internet, we had the ARPANET. I think we are in this phase now, but who will invent the TCP IP protocol? Who will invent the Netscape browser? Those are the guys that, that will survive in the end. And no one talks about Usenet today. So um, th this is, it, it's hard to say if Ethereum is surviving, they, or if it's the, the, the fast follower that will survive this, but they will definitely play a role in the next five years but i think there will be two or more players in the market that that will be um, maybe leading the market as well and we have not touched any other big ecosystems yet or runner ups like substrate based uh, blockchains in the polkadot universe algorand oh, yeah, exactly. or cosmos yeah. based where you actually get a yeah. framework to build your own blockchain uh, so there's many many more to come it's hard to keep <laughs> up isn't it yes it's yeah. Scary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I always, I also have to agree. Like um, the the amount of like new layer ones or layer twos that are currently being developed is just like it's very hard to catch up on on like all the new trends. I think uh, zk sync is right now but, like a very hot topic. Um, there's like already some some exchanges being built on it, like Mute or like other services, which I think looks very promising for the future. But one thing I would like to uh, follow up on is. Um, EVM compat uh, compatibility, because it was now mentioned quite often. And um, don't you guys also see it this way that, let's say, for example, um, I'm Curve, I'm, I'm operating on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, now there's more EVM compatible uh, layer ones basically constantly joining. 
Um, isn't it like from a game series perspective, um, always like the dominant strategy to basically always go and deploy on every new layer one that's basically uh, right now entering the market? Because if I would not do so, um, likely somebody would just fork my protocol. Very interesting. This happened, for example, on Phantom. I think on Phantom, we can see Geist Finance, which is just like an uh, Aave fork. Um, so this is already very much taking place. So all this open source uh, forking, um, do, you, do you think this really creates also the pressure on protocols to, to go multi-chain just for market share? What I can tell you is that the more multi-chain they go, the better is for us, right? Because we're an Oracle provider and we integrate with all the chains. Um, but um, I don't know if there's a pressure to, to go multi-chain. Potentially, yes, given how the ecosystem is developing. And, and you've referenced the Polkadot ecosystem and a couple of others, right? Um, but I guess it depends on the business model and what niche of the market uh, is needed to be captured. Uh, it's hard to generalize uh, at this stage. And whenever I think about forks, the coolest fork for me is the Uniswap Sushi Swap one. And we saw what happened there. Um, so, yeah, uh, let's not forget that there's a community and community persistence and attachment to a particular chain or business model angle that needs to, to be uh, taken into account as well. But like I said, for us, uh, let the multi chains explode because. Um, it's, it's better business for Oracle provision. I'm not a hundred percent sure. And because that I think it's always, business? oh no, because it leads to fragmentation. That actually leads to a business. Where case. we bridge fragmentation yeah, it, that we can help bridge. Uh, I, for example, there's a couple of link tokens on Binance Smart Chain and you don't yeah. know which link token is which. Uh, but so we're that, not link. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm aware. I was just taking it as an example where fragmentation might also have um, yeah, a, a negative uh, result in going multi-chain. So uh, that's actually leading to a use case from ITSA uh, uh, to identify which token is which. But overall, if you're on several chains, you need to make sure um, uh, that your brand and value proposition is protected because uh, it can lead to fragmentation and that then might not be as cool as having one token with one name and one whatever use case representing a brand and uh, uh, a value proposition. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I agree and disagree, but yeah, let's give the others uh, uh, the chance to, to input because then we transform it into a bilateral conversation. <laughs> Go ahead, guys. Um, yeah, I and please take this as an opinion from someone who's not an engineer. I um, am afraid that actually, um, you know, protocols or these solutions might be forced to be on as many um, blockchains as possible. But as an infrastructure provider, you know, um, we are adding protocol support constantly, but also it takes a while. Um, I would say at least four weeks, uh, probably even more from um, starting the implementation to going through several testing phases and quality checks to make sure that the product we're providing is actually good. And so if you are now forcing stuff like Uniswap or Curve to onboard new protocols all the time, I'm afraid, and I said, not an engineer, that uh, the speed that is required might actually also lead to mistakes. And I think this is an interesting phase where we are in at the moment with DeFi that there's always like, it seems every week or other week, there's a new DEX on a new protocol that has created APYs for um, liquidity mining and stuff like that. But also there's some, um, let's say security or, or risk attached to it when it comes to the underlying code, I guess. And um, this for sure is also something that might slow down adoption, especially institutional adoption. And so I, I think this, this might be a tough challenge for these providers. Um, and just one comment from a different perspective, uh, what I think would be great for adoption and what I personally would like a lot, if I don't need to be on 10 DEXs to participate, but could consolidate um, all my DeFi products into um, one provider, be it um, Curve or something else. Uh, and I think this is also something that is lacking that if you want to participate in a lot of different things that you also need, you know, a ton of wallets, um, 
a ton of websites to participate in and it's sometimes hard to keep track what exactly you're doing where and when you are earning what. Yeah, that's, that's actually a good point, the security. I, but, but I'm kind of referring to what I said before, it, it's going to be copied, it's going to explode. Everything is copied one-to-one -to, -one to new blockchains. The security aspect is a big one because it causes natural selection. And um, it's not like in, in the real world where, or in the current world where you, you have a, um, a failing bank and the state is going to save the money for the customers or, or um, yeah, come up with the money for the customers. But in the DeFi world, your funds are lost if the protocol is hacked or if the if the blockchain doesn't work correctly. So it's probably even faster natural selection than in, in the in the legacy world. For us, it's it's uh, for us it's probably good because the more complex the space gets, the more aggregation the customer needs, especially if you're institutional, and and you have to to you know take them by the hand and and lead them into the space of DeFi and and give them the tools they need, so that. The more it gets complex, the, the better for us, I'd say, for, for, for our company, because we have to reduce that complexity. But yeah, it, it can lead to fear and, and, um, and doubt. Yeah, mm -hmm. just to add one more insertion to what Stefan was saying, but you saw that there are all of these DeFi hubs for cross-chain uh, yield generating, right? And farming and staking. So whenever there comes a problem, that's, I think, uh, what's interesting in DeFi. There's always, you know, the second day you have a solution, of course, needs to, to be upgraded and enabled with all the necessary security features. But there are solutions, like I said, the DeFi hubs and all of the multi-chain bridges. Um, so, yeah, I wouldn't be too concerned uh, ultimately, but it will take some time to develop correctly. Out of a technical mm -hmm. point of perspective, I think uh, there is reason at least a little to be concerned because the node software is mostly not enterprise ready. So we see, especially in the new protocols, um, that chains or nodes are getting stuck while syncing uh, and uh, there's memory leaks. So uh, uh, I'm very confident to state that uh, most node software on most blockchain is not enterprise ready yet. So let's give it a, a, like between 50 mm. and maybe 80%. This needs to mature a big time out of our operational perspective. Uh, and we are talking main that's big networks. Are you mm -hmm. talking to the to the developers as well? Or, and do you raise that topic to the communities? Occasionally, with uh, we have one or two. I, I don't want to name. We have one or two close partnership with with node developers, uh, but uh, especially on the newer blockchains, we don't. But uh, okay. yeah, interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just to mitigate this, and I agree from an infrastructural uh, standpoint that it's not yet compatible with the requirements of an enterprise uh, well solution for, for various angles. But I think uh, what stops enterprise adoption in TradFi and other um, industries or other segments is not just this, right? So it's not just the infrastructure problem. There are a couple of other roadblocks to be handled. So uh, hopefully uh, it will all happen in parallel. And by the time all of the others, and I, I mean, the most pressing one is the reg one, right? Because no TradFi institution would enter DeFi uh, currently unless they are a hedge fund or a professional trader. Uh, so yeah, there are a couple, there's like a, I don't know, a suite of, of things that need to be tackled before you have scalable uh, enterprise uh, solutions in DeFi uh, in terms of node infrastructure and a couple of other things. So yeah, that's why I said from a retail perspective, things are being uh, well taken care of progressively, but in, in an enterprise context, it will take longer, I, would, I agree. Yeah, I was just coming from a technology perspective and I think there's way more, let's say backup, for example, if you have a blockchain that spits out 250 terabytes a year, uh, uh, that will be a fun part to index and to backup and to make it available or to resync an archive node, uh, which might or not be uh, need to be done at some point if you want to set up something in this regard. Uh, uh, if we go the Solana route, we are talking petabytes. So, and if you would like to um, say do taxes uh, on a petabyte blockchain and you need information going back to close to Genesis block, have fun with that. So there's also logical problems beside, uh, besides the technology 
uh, aspects here. Mm -hmm. I have to say that's very interesting because most people um, are actually not fully aware of the of the blockchain trilemma, right? Where you have this, this trade-off between uh, centralized, uh, decentralization, scalability, and security. So the Bitcoin or the Ethereum network uh, are highly uh, secure and highly decentralized, having like a lot of nodes, full full nodes, uh, while other networks, like for example, like Solana. Um, they require, they have at the moment less nodes and the nodes need to be way more powerful. And I know there was already like a, an outage with Solana where the, the blockchain was down, I think for even several hours. I think something similar has also already happened to Phantom, um, where there's currently also just 56 uh, uh, validators. So I, I, I fully agree that um, security is one aspect um, that always needs to be taken account, especially if we are always criticizing Ethereum uh, for side transaction fees, because um, Ethereum is certainly a very secure chain. Um, and I think this is still an advantage that Ethereum has over like most other uh, layer ones. Um, just because uh, just, we were just, uh, just, already... just, yeah? just one point, Chris, I mean, Peter, but with this, what you said, that would mean um, that uh, talking about natural selection later on, that Solana will probably not be in the final five because uh, there can be if 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 they keep on doing this, there can be no um, there can be no um, infrastructure for institutional build up because you oh, cannot no. uh, track petabytes of data, right? No, it's just getting expensive. So uh, the two hundred fifty yeah. terabyte blockchain is Binance Smart Chain, yeah. uh, and we like Binance Smart Chain. There's lots of trades going on. Uh, we get lots of uh, question asked, and uh, uh, we are supposed to index them. But uh, then, uh, say for uh, index access uh, for Ethereum, it's a couple of hundred bucks a month if you would like to sell that data and do something meaningful with it. Yeah. Um, well, in this case, just a rough estimate, then it might be a five-digit five number you need to come up with if you would like to index uh, the whole chain since Genesis and make that available to a customer. So uh, yeah. in the end, it's coming down to price and what you actually need. Most people just need one smart contract uh, on one of these chains, and then you can actually reduce the data set big time. Uh, uh, but you need to know that in advance. Uh, before you are getting the data. So the law, further you go back, the more data you need, obviously, yeah. the higher uh, yeah. uh, the space requirements. But overall, um, it, it's just an aspect one needs to consider uh, besides uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the praise of DeFi or any uh, 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 USP on-chain, you always have to consider the fabric, the operations, as well as um, the data provision and the data backup, the data of reinstantiation, course. or uh, as, as Christian said, uh, the trilemma overall as a logical aspect. Yeah. That's all I was saying. But but as I mean, as, as the more expensive it gets, the less it will be adopted by the market, and then they will change to other blockchains. That's what Not I mean. Not necessarily. So let's let's say we are doing a forex on solana and there's only like 10 or 15 global players uh, who are interested in that and they're making huge amounts of uh, uh, profit uh, millions of trades per second uh, yeah. and um, it, it's just to specify a, a more specific infrastructure serving speci yeah, okay. more specific needs uh, and uh, I'm pretty sure that this will happen. This is just one extreme, but there's others. For example, I mentioned the energy web chain, um, couple of seconds, block times, uh, uh, very cheap gas fees, and they're doing carbon dioxide certificate rates. So that's mm -hmm. another use case, or, uh, uh, a specific use phase for a specific chain or vice versa. Yeah. So um, it's just a, a, a logical problem here and it's way more, you could go further down. Uh, do you need a public infrastructure? Can the, these be a consortia infrastructure? Who is doing business? Uh, uh, who is uh, benefiting from this? Uh, obviously yeah. there are other solutions like for example, the graph on Ethereum mainnet where you can provide specific data for specific smart contracts in a decentralized way. So if you would like to access this more often, you might not possibly need to run your own graph node or, mm. uh, uh, and so on. So you need, uh, th this is um, complex and this yeah, needs uh, to be investigated further depending on the use case and the dependency on that use case as well, the, the, the business dependency. Yeah. And it might get expensive as always in IT. 
No. Yeah. And depending yeah. on the customer, right? Because I don't think, for instance, a global bank really cares so much about decentralization. They would care about security, right? But they, I mean, speaking about the trade-off between the three elements, they don't care about decentralization. They want security, reliability. So they, they would certainly opt for a consortia-driven uh, solution. Uh, so yeah, it's very, it's it's highly relevant in terms of the customer base. Uh, and speaking about global banks or other types of, of financial institutions at scale, uh, they wouldn't have a problem with the cost either, right? So they could pay a lot of money to uh, choose whatever works best. And also in terms of, because I, I have interactions, um, regular interactions with TradFi players. Um, if when they are ready to to enter this space, they would most certainly choose Ethereum as a first step, and then they could expand into other chains. But right now, they've come to grasp with, with understanding what Ethereum represents. If and it's a big if they choose to go on a public chain path. Mm hmm. Yeah, um, one thing I, I just want to note is um, what I really feel is, is like Bitcoin and Ethereum are two networks um, where the concept is really that everybody is able to, to run a validator or like um, to, to validate basically transactions, while it's really for Solana. Um, being a validator is really not an option for like retail customers. I think it requires around 256 gigabytes of like RAM and there's like just like Peter just said, like there's a lot of data streams. Um, so I, I also see that basically um, back to the blockchain trilemma that there's like really differences also between the different layer ones so that each has like specific use cases. And for me, it's always a bit like uh, with the ISS uh, space station where you have maybe like the main module is Ethereum and then you're basically um, docking like new parameters on it and then basically the functionality overall grows. Um, but because we have Stefan also here, um, I know that uh, Block Demon is offering uh, institutional grade um, nodes, and you have developed this um, service uh, Ubiquity, where you bundle uh, several uh, protocols in one API. And I was actually yesterday when I was reading a lot about that, I was very curious, like how how is this developing for you guys? And um, are you going to like expand to like more protocols, uh, to more networks, or what's the current plans? Because this was something I was really interested in. Okay, sure. Um, happy to give some insights into that. But before that, I just want to give one note on the validator nodes. <clears throat> of course, you're right. Um, and I think this might actually be a maybe a small decentralization problem, if you will, because um, these protocols don't make it super easy to run the validators. And also for Ethereum, um, you're right. For example, a Bitcoin full node, probably everyone could set up and run. Um, a Ethereum 2 validator might be possible, but you know who can afford 32 ETH today? So that makes it, uh, that's a hurdle. And also I think, um, or if I'm informed correctly with the merge and the beacon chain, and potentially the uptime requirements will go up again and then you always have to ask yourself, are you really fine with getting less rewards because you run it yourself? Or would you just throw it into, let's say, Lido or um, stake it on Kraken or wherever, wherever, where you can do, let's say, somewhat liquid, somewhat partial staking and get better rewards. So yeah, running validator nodes um, in a decentralized fashion is, a, is an interesting task. But uh, that just as a comment. Um, for Ubiquity, yes, um, this is our data API. And I would say, you know, Blockdaemon started as a um, node infrastructure company um, providing first access to Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, that stuff, and then expanding to over you now 40 protocols. And what we want to offer in the org, and the goal was always to make blockchain access as easy as possible and get away um, one pain point from a lot of people building on blockchain, which is that they have to run their own infrastructure. And if they are exposed to several protocols, um, soon you will probably need more than one specialist who will maintain your five, six different nodes for different protocols. And so with Ubiquity, we want to make this even more scalable, hopefully, um, let's say in half a year, offering access through an API to 20, 30, or even more protocols where you would just switch out um, basically the endpoint link to use exactly the same queries for uh, different protocols, um, which means we will uh, support different ways to call data 
um, through the native API or through a standardized API, which would be the same for all of the supported protocols. Um, just making access as easy as possible. Also for free, I think up to, I want to say 1 million or 5 million calls per month. And then it's basically a paper um, request model, if you will, uh, which I think is pretty competitive. And mostly, of course, for companies or developers that have exposure to a lot of different protocols, not only one or two. And so, you know, um, basically, if you are, let's say, a starting up custodian or maybe someone who's into DeFi and needs to query a lot of different protocols, um, this might be a great tool uh, to not worry about running the infrastructure to get everything from a single source and be able to build tooling that just uh, requires you to switch out one endpoint link. Mm -hmm. Because like what I was questioning myself was also um, like we're always talking about institutionals in DeFi and I think Joanna also just said it, that we will see uh, that we are currently seeing mostly VCs and hedge funds uh, operating in that field. Um, what's really still like lacking um, also from like um, like node software or like in general analytics um, so that this becomes more interesting also for like traditional financial institutions. I think like just, just one little remark, I mean, um, stable coin farming um, has become, I think, also very popular uh, in the in the recent half a year. There are sometimes yields between like 50 to 100 percent, I would say, uh, outperforming like many stocks. I'm, I'm always curious um, when we will see more engagement by traditional uh, financial companies um, in the DeFi sector. Anybody about that? I'm sure maybe I can give just a small opinion so that I'm not talking all the time. Yeah. But yeah, I, I sure. think you can actually um, combine this with what we are offering and also what the other three here are offering. Um, because I think the first step is providing easy access to blockchains. And for example, who we are talking to is a lot of KYC and auditing firms at the moment. And I think this might be a first really important step. And you know, those guys, of course, would, if possible, let's say buy access to 100 different blockchains from us. But, you know, as said before, there's um, limits and capabilities that also we have. And so we try to make this access as easy as possible for them, provide them with the tooling they need to, you know, let's say bring KYC or more compliance features and analytics features to the blockchain. And then, uh, as said, Blockdaemon most of the time provides the really the base layer. And um, I think, and with this, I want to give the word to someone else, um, you guys are then building uh, on top of this and make good products. Yeah, yeah. I think we, we are we are very far away from from actually those TradFi uh, players entering uh, the market, and and um, I don't know, maybe for another three years, four years. Um, what our um, value proposition is based on is 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 um, more or less. Well, we we see two things missing. It's a totally fragmented value chain, investment value chain. So from the first step of building your, and I'm talking from a user perspective, not, not so much from a technical perspective. So from um, you know building up your investment strategy, all the way until you know selling your assets and reporting on it, um, you have to, to speak in, in pictures. You have to have ten tabs on your browser browser open to to go through that value chain. So this is too fragmented and you need, you need um, offerings in the market that can aggregate those or at least have only two or three tabs open. Um, the second thing is speaking of, of the, you know, of the institutional hierarchy of, of needs, so to say the pyramid, everyone in the market is now uh, talking about compliance and about security. So um, custody and, and the regulation. No one is talking about reporting, monitoring needs and research needs. I mean, research is, is a big thing um, and, and there's already a lot of players in the market, but you know they are only touching the surface of what you really need as an institutional player in terms of research. So those are the two things that, that we want to dive in as a company um, because those will be the things that, that will, you know, if, if the regulation is there, if the security is there, um, execution is already in the market. There's a lot of player way, players where you can execute, but you need to report, you need to research on your strategies. And, and this is the next big thing that will be missing. And those are the needs for institutional investors that, that we want to provide in the future. 
Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. I think the biggest deterrent is still lack of regulation or lack of regulatory clarity when it comes to institution. I mean, if we look at the regulatory environment across the globe, um, it's fragmented across the globe. It's fragmented intra-jurisdiction. Uh, so for instance, in the United States, you have a variety of agencies that, uh, for instance, categorize Bitcoin differently. So for a single asset, you have the CFTC, the SEC, uh, the IRS, even looking at it differently, right? So within one country, uh, there's no harmonization between uh, the supervisors in terms of what that asset should be classified as. As sorry, uh, in the European Union, they're pushing to change that dynamic because they're now negotiating on a piece of law, the Markets in Crypto Assets Regulation, which is supposed to offer some level of harmonization. Um, but I'm not sure how much DeFi will be tackled within it, right? Because currently the discussion is around stable coins that is perceived to be um, the biggest danger uh, for the central banks as well as for, um, as for other TradFi players. And when I say for, for the central banks, I mean privately issued stable coins, because obviously the central banks want to have their own uh, wholesale and retail. Um, so yeah, I would say that this is still the biggest deterrent. I don't see it um, solved in the next year or two, uh, like Fabian said, potentially three to four years down the line. Uh, however, our value prop uh, for traditional players, and it's all, also one of the reasons why I'm engaging with them, is that we offer, uh, well, via Oracle provision and, and via access to our API, we offer access for TradFi players to uh, transparent data feeds in terms of uh, asset prices, for instance, right? So the way our model works, we ingest uh, data, trade level data from centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges. We sanitize it, we filter it, and uh, our methodologies are transparent. And then we output the result into the API and from there uh, push it as an or oracleizing it for smart contracts uh, for on-chain applications and via the API for off-chain applications and off-chain projects, right? So uh, someone using our product can actually have full transparency in terms of how a particular price point was arrived at. And that is very, very relevant for, uh, for institutional players. We've seen uh, a lot of movement in terms of uh, derivatives tra trading, crypto derivatives trading, um, and also custody. So I see these two things as still predominant uh, when it comes to especially global banks entering the space. Um, and I see Oracle provision there as, as highly relevant, especially uh, when it comes to, like I said, transparent data feeds and, and compliant, compliance data set, compliance driven or compliant data sets, which is what we offer. Um, we've also re launched recently, very recently, uh, a series of index products. Um, and again, this is another angle where institutions could come in um or even why not let's hope um someone uh, an entity like citigroup being a benchmark administrator for a metaverse index right so yeah uh, the opportunities are there but like i said this the biggest deterrent deterrent still remains um lack of regulatory clarity which i hope will be tackled sooner rather than later mm -hmm. Uh, th thank you, Anna. Uh, I, I found it also very uh, interesting that you guys um, are now offering also a price feed for abracadabra money or like, uh, should rather say magic internet money. Uh, I think this was like a big phenomena like in the last weeks, in the last months, um, like a multi-chain uh, stablecoin. And uh, as you guys already said uh, correctly, I think this uh, this issue with regulation is really something that's that's holding or the whole market at the moment a bit back. I mean, um, we, we know that, for example, USDC uh, got into trouble with the SEC, um, who didn't like their the lending program. And in DeFi, what I see at the moment is very much that um, the creation of DAOs um, allows DeFi to basically escape all this regulation. And by that, um, yeah, basically strive and basically grow. And that's also why I think uh, it's very interesting to see, like, for example, DIA providing then price feeds for, for project like uh, the magic internet money. Um, well, one thing I would also like to speak about um, in regard to DeFi, because I think this is something that we have also seen uh, starting this year is NFTs. 
Um, the role of NFTs, I mean, um, Uniswap version three, for example, um, they use NFTs so that you can basically say, uh, this is my price range. In this price range, I want to provide liquidity. Uh, I know you, Joanna, um, you are also very much involved into uh, play to earn. Um, and also, um, I, I, what I've seen, what I'm seeing right now is, for example, on Harmony, there is something called DeFi Kingdoms, and DeFi Kingdoms is um, gamification of decentralized finance. So, what what I'm observing is, okay, we have here DeFi, uh, this metaverse, NFTs, and basically all these three spaces are slowly moving together, and uh, they're starting to have a symbiosis. Is there maybe something? Um, but you have recently perceived um, in, in the whole round um, wh where the, what's the direction we are heading at, um, what, what role do NFTs might play in the future even more than now? Sorry, I don't want to monopolize the conversation, but I have to pick on something that you said, which I think is interesting. You said gamification of DeFi. Well, actually, I think DeFi is gamification of traditional finance. So you see there's that kind of continuum. Um, so yeah, I'm so happy you touched on this because because like you correctly observed, I am, I am bullish on the whole uh, metaverse as an open eco economic system trend. Where do NFTs come in? Uh, and again, let's take a step back again. I mean, this virtual environment and wor virtual worlds, they're not new. They emerged in the early 2000s as a form of escapism, uh, if you will. But then you didn't have uh, the whole coordination mechanisms and, and game, theoretics, game theoretic mechanics and incentive design structures that you have now via what we call Web3, right? So this stack of decentralized technologies. And this is why, yeah, even though it was a trend, uh, like this virtual escapism was a trend in the early 2000s, it didn't really evolve that far. Um, so I call it a quasi failure. However, now we have all of these primitives that enable um, these um, open economic system-based entities to thrive. So the central land, the sandbox, um, virtual real estate, digital fashion, gaming, uh, play to earn, everything has now the underlying structure, decentralized underlying structure that will enable them to, to flourish. Um, and this is why I find it interesting. And I, I think it's, it just goes beyond the trend. It will evolve into something very significant uh, because it's driven by gaming and gaming is probably the most market capped industry currently. Uh, it's probably the most valuable. Uh, but going back to NFTs. So NFTs represent digital ownership of a portion of the internet, if you will, because you have digital ownership of an object, uh, which you didn't really have the tools to have before. In a web 2.0 environment, you rent what you use from the platforms you, you are using it on, right? For Facebook, Google, uh, etc. Et in web through in web three via NFTs, amongst other tools, you now have the capacity and the ability to have digital ownership um, of a specific object. So by extension, you have digital ownership of, of a part of the internet. And this is why I think this is a very interesting iteration uh, in in um, the the development of the internet. I see the metaverse as a new the new frontier a new frontier of the internet that is powered by DAOs as a new form of companies but all company but also um, governance structures um, and i believe that currently there's a lot of traction around nfts embedded in decentralized finance you can use nfts as collateral either via fractionalizing them or or wrapping them in erc20 uh, or via a variety of other tooling that you have at disposal and you see that symbiosis layer layer there um, and we're really really bullish on that and i'll stop talking and let the other panelists uh, have a say in this. The stage is your guys. Any comment? I, I can't comment too much on it but because I'm not uh, such a big NFT expert. But what I found interesting was because you said uh, the um, gamification of, of, of DeFi. Um, I read the other day that the other way around the bringing NFTs to the gaming scene is, is a little bit harder to do because apparently the hardcore gaming scene and the NFT scene or the hardcore gaming scene is actually opposed to crypto. I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if that is true, but um, but this is something that I read the other day and I, I'd like to hear your opinion on this. So you, you get me talking again. Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you are right to some extent. I, I wouldn't say opposed. 
but game developers care about security, about um, handling their own issues that, I've, that they have noticed in in-game uh, structures, right? As opposed to opening it up the platforms to enable value interoperability. So yes, it is true. Game developers are not necessarily fascinated by crypto. However, they do understand crypto very well. Mm -hmm. They understand, like I said, uh, in-game value, which is very similar to tokenomics, uh, if you will. Yeah, yeah. And it actually happens that the DeFi structure is the organic structure for um, these, let alone blockchain development games, blockchain gaming in the metaverse, because you wouldn't use the traditional rails uh, for value transfer, for instance, right? So the mm -hmm. ideal state would be where you have open gaming entities or blockchain-based uh, games whereby whatever you create in a certain game can be transferable into another other, either game or another metaverse powered uh, entity. And for that, yeah. you need DeFi and you need the okay. tool that DeFi offers because there's no way you can, you can link into, the, into TradFi Rails. So I guess yeah. I agree with what you said. They're not necessarily keen on uh, you know, uh, creating a symbiosis with crypto. However, crypto offers all of the necessary tooling to even tackle security because blockchain has a way mm -hmm. we've discussed it extensively here of, of tackling security in, in yeah, distributed ecosystems. And mm -hmm. now I will stop talking. Uh, I think it's a super interesting topic. Um, and I mean, I agree with what both of you said. Um, also, if you look at NFT and you, you know, you take a platform like Twitter, of course, um, emotions always get really extreme there, but I would say there are some people that really love it and some that hate it a lot. Um, for example, for art, because there's a lot of um, uh, thefts, right, or thieves that just take someone else's art, make an NFT out of it and profit from it. Um, obviously, that's a problem. And I would say uh, these people spread a lot of misinformation. And um, it's just another scene, let's say, parts of the art community that are vocal, parts of the gaming community. I think a lot of people still need to be educated on it. But then I think... Um, having NFTs in games, having them powered the assets on blockchain seems like a no-brainer because at some point the gamers will realize, oh, now I can own the game that I used to own physically, right? Like with the, let's say, Nintendo 64, you had this cartridge. Now everything is digital. You cannot sell it. You cannot give it to a friend. Um, and if the platform goes down, you don't, you know, you only have the not really ownership rights, but usage rights on their platform. And so at some point, people will realize that they can now again own their games digitally, that they can own the assets in game, that they can even make money off it, maybe in a legal uh, way. And um, I think this will put a lot of pressure on the, let's say, big behemoth of the marketplaces, which would be Steam for computer or Android store and Apple store for the mobile devices, which is a huge thing. And you can see like Steam has banned all blockchain games just, I'm going to say, a month ago. Um, at some point, they probably will not be able to do this anymore. Um, but for now, I think, and I think this is a key part of all blockchain, right? Uh, it needs more education, more people need to understand how it works. And I think it also needs to get a, a little simpler, maybe. Um, that blockchain or um, DeFi and NFTs really get accessible to the masses super easily, um, that you can take away the fear of creating a wallet losing your seed phrase and your password and never being able to exit your tokens again. Um, this might make DeFi a little centralized uh, every now and then, because I think, you know, uh, until we get there where everyone is comfortable managing their own wallet, um, we will need interim solutions that are somewhat uh, centralized. But yeah, uh, I, I think it comes down a lot to, to education because the potential definitely is there for NFTs in a lot of spaces and DeFi applications. But I think most people just don't get it yet. Fully agreed. I'm not a gamer, so I can't say too much. Uh, I uh, hear lots of uh, opinions on both parties. Uh, so there's also an op op opposing opinion uh, that uh, there's lots of harvesting going on uh, in games, but uh, they don't like to play the game. They just go there for making money in the game. So uh, I just want to put that out. So I don't have a really educated opinion here, but I'm uh, still very bullish on NFTs because it's a, a logical financial building block to be literally uh, not be able to split it and uh, to uh, secure ownership uh, on chain. 
uh, or history. So I already mentioned the Breitling watches uh, and there's many more um, interesting NFT going on uh, or use cases going on uh, with aspects in the real world. We, for example, as any blog also love Pope, proof of attendance and presence. Uh, which is also NFT, super cheap to make. You can create your own party, give everyone a Pope token, uh, give it a, a, a logo or something, and then you can um, put on benefits or uh, check digitally who attended that party or uh, has been there, voted or did something uh, uh, in, in uh, a future reference or uh, a history backwards. So that, that is a thing um, that will be huge. Uh, so you can get uh, uh, benefits if you attended something or you've been with a group or you did something in the past. Uh, and this can be uh, evaluated uh, uh, for years to come on a public infrastructure. Uh, and other aspects with NFTs, uh, I find super interesting if the value uh, is pretty bit big of the goods they are securing. For example, think uh, airplane parts. There's a huge market in airplane parts and you can now actually bring in NFC, near field communication uh, elements uh, in metal. So you can't carve that out and you can create then a digital pounder part with NFTs on chain. Uh, so uh, you can't forge or uh, uh, manipulate uh, the user's record of a used airplane part for example, and they are very expensive and there's a huge aftermarket or a huge uh, used uh, parts market. And uh, so there, there's many of these aspects, put them in cars, put them in any parts, wine bottles, whatever art, uh, like physical art. Uh, and I think there will be many, many more use cases where you can actually interact with the real world and the NFC will be part on, uh, of the uh, digital identity of that physical part. So uh, there will be Uh, huge use cases and uh, lots of benefits for the consumers, the traders, more security in trading, in evaluating goods and so forth. I, I liked what you said, Peter, about proof of attendance and what that entails, because it will all be at one point part of the decentralized uh, reputation system that we all strive to get to uh, and which will also be very helpful in terms of uh, getting more traditional institutions in, into, into DeFi, because once you have the digital identity and, and well, reputation system established, it's easier um, to amalgamate and insert all of these TradFi angles in. And I actually am one of the strongest believers in and proponents of the creation of a decentralized reputation system, which would be stored on chain. Of course, there are some issues with that, right? Because it means you cannot have a make a mistake ever on chain because it will be then um, tied to you for eternity, more or less. Uh, but yeah, um, it's it's uh, it's one of the major missing building blocks when it comes to DeFi and decentralized systems. Um, uh, uh, thanks that you said that reputation is, I think, one of the biggest aspects of blockchain identity, reputation. So uh, that will be super huge. Just think of your becoming a good, con a good consumer. Uh, you're not sending back that much stuff if you buy clothes. So you get actually a discount because uh, uh, you are a, a wise orderer in respect to someone who's ordering stuff and sending it back all the time. Uh, or uh, uh, your complaints are useful. Therefore, I give you a bonus as, as, as a supplier, for example. So, and I think reputation, good or bad, um, will be huge uh, on, on blockchain or blockchain will, the infra will be the infrastructure for that. And I think there will be um, uh, the necessity to actually inflate that so that uh, your reputation goes up and down as you use it so that you can actually uh, uh, also be able to do mistakes. Uh, but overall, I think, uh, actually, I once started with this ENS Uh, what address do I want to put on my name on and what uh, uh, tokens would I like to get associated to these? Because once it's done, it's done. That will be like my name. It will be that address. And uh, it actually started with the whole Pope uh, things. Uh, I attended uh, whatever uh, Ethereum conferences. I subscribed certain newsletters. Um, what address do I want to put that on? Uh, that then therefore benefits for this, but also maybe get discriminated at some point in time. So uh, yes, there, there will be lots of uh, uh, good and bad stuff going on with NFTs and especially reputation.
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think um, we are already very close to 12 p.m. I just want to pick up on, on what you just said, Peter. Um, I also believe that uh, digital identities, SSIs, um, I know that the European Union is also very much involved into this right now. Um, I could picture that this could really drive a lot of blockchain adoption uh, in the near future because this is like a super relevant use case, right? Let's say you're from Germany or from France and you need some documents to Spain, uh, this verification, this reputation, right? This is, I think, exactly this use case of blockchain where it makes absolutely sense. And uh, I feel like all these digital identities is still um, was a big topic in the past. And I certainly think that in 2022, um, we will hear way more about that again and see also a lot more adoption. Um, yeah, just just to put it um, short, I, I, I very much uh, like the talk that we had here today. I hope we can maybe even schedule uh, another uh, webinar, maybe even with uh, similar people for, for next year, because I, I think there was a lot of interesting details, a lot of insider infos uh, from all of you guys, Fabian, Peter, Joanna, uh, Stefan. Um, therefore, I want to thank you for, for being here today. Um, and I think you all are... Uh, as excited as me uh, to follow up um, on basically where DeFi is heading. Um, one last note, because um, this was something um, that I figured uh, last year or like yeah one and a half years ago. Uh, in 2019, I had to write a little paper about P2P lending. Um, and uh, I know that Fabian uh, in the last webinar with, with Philip was um, also talking about that, that basically Bitcoin was introduced in 2007, 2008 after the financial crisis. And after the financial crisis, um, we also saw a lot of P2P lending being developed in, in the UK, in London. So this is actually something that I have just recently noticed that basically BTC and uh, this DeFi trend are some, somewhat the same age and that DeFi has just started to pick up really in the last one or two years. And um, so I think there's a lot of more to come uh, in the near future. And I would be very happy to have further discussions with you guys. And I thank you very much for being here today with me. And I also thank very much the audience uh, for tuning in to our webinar today. Thank you, Christian. And thank My you. My pleasure. Thank Thanks, you Christian. all. Yeah. Thanks to you all. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Bye-bye. 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 Bye. 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 Bye.